It's been several decades since the gap between men and women's wages hit the political and economic radar in Canada. And yet, it persists nonetheless. What's more, according to a new series published in the Globe and Mail, that's not the only glaring disparity between the genders at work. There is also a striking power gap that leaves women behind both in clout and money. Robin Doolittle is an investigative reporter at The Globe who led the team digging into this, and she joins us now from the west end of the provincial capital to explain. Robin, it's good to see you again. How are you managing these days? We're surviving over here. Glad to hear it. Uh, let's just start with this, because, of course, you and your team have the opportunity to basically, you know, bite into any subject at any time you want. So why this topic and why now? It sounds nuts, but we started this back in 2018. Uh, I don't try to set out to do these massive year-long projects, but it does just seem like something our uh, our team gravitates towards. Um, it was early 2018. It was just in the post-Me Too era where the conversation was starting to move beyond sexual violence to a broader discussion about gender inequities. And at the time, I was also about to take a maternity leave. So I was thinking a lot about um, motherhood and how uh, babies were going were to impact my career and also other women's careers. And at the same time, there was a scandal in the United Kingdom because BBC journalists uh, learned through uh, some disclosure laws that had recently passed in that country that they were being dramatically underpaid compared to their male colleagues. And we got to talking and thought, wouldn't this be interesting if we could try to dig into this in Canada, this issue of women in the workplace? And Initially, it was very focused on wages. I think you've probably heard the statistic that women make um, 87 cents for every dollar that a man makes. But that's the overall hourly average of all women compared to all men. And I think what I wanted to know and what my colleagues wanted to know was, are men and women in the exact same job making the same money? Like, is that actually, like, does that pay gap exist? And uh, that's where the project started, and it went much further than that. It sure did, and here's how you describe it in the pages of the Globe and Mail. What is the power gap? Here we go, Sheldon. When people talk about the glass ceiling, it usually refers to women breaking through to the C-suite or president's office. But the Globe's analysis has found that women seem to be topping out as mid-level managers. In truth, the ceiling metaphor isn't a great one because the numbers don't show a hard barrier women can't cross. It's more of a leaky pipeline. In many workplaces, especially universities, the leak visibly accelerates a few rungs up from the bottom. What is clear is that by the highest salary band, women are dramatically outnumbered. What does this mid-level management situation look like in practical terms? Like, where are women actually getting stuck here? So this is, I think, the big takeaway from our investigation. Um, as I said, we were very narrowly focused on wages to start, but when we started getting the data back, what we found was wages were a problem, but the bigger issue was just the lack of women. There were so many more men by almost every measure. And one of the ways that we looked at this issue was we divided up the hundreds of different organizations, institutions, entities in our data set into salary bands to see the distribution, uh, the, uh, the gender divide at different salary levels. And what was just clear as day is that there were lots of women in the lower salary bands, but at the very top, there were very few women. And that gap started to accelerate about halfway to the top. So what was really interesting is this idea of this, the glass ceiling, like what in that paragraph it said is, I think we so often think about the glass ceiling as being in the president's office, but women are hitting that glass ceiling as mid-level managers. You can see their numbers just start to sharply decline. Um, and, and it isn't, you know, an actual just like a level that they don't pass. It, it is slow. Uh, but what's clear is that by the end, they're gone. Do you know why it happens? Well, this is the subject of recent stories and what's going to be the subject of the rest of our series over the course of the year. Um, I guess there's there's two things that we've really highlighted so far. Uh, one is there's a large body of research that looks at the cultural, sociological um, barriers that women encounter. This is the stuff that you've probably heard about. You know, there's 
Um, women are penalized for exhibiting traits that are revered in men, traits that happen to be associated with leadership, things like ambition, confidence. Um, women pay more of a price uh, for having children than men do. Um, women are penalized for success. People are, they, they're viewed more negatively. So there's all of those kind of stereotypes and biases that are working against women. But the other side of it, which was the subject of a story we published last week that I think is just really important, is the laws in this country um, that prevent gender discrimination have been on the books for decades. You couldn't add a single one that would make things better, um, You know, the experts that I'm talking to say. The problem is they aren't being enforced. It, it's very difficult if you are the victim of gender discrimination to to find any recourse. Um, and that's for a variety of, of reasons that we get into in the piece. Okay, Robin, let's, if we can, um, somewhat briskly go through the methodology here, because people are going to want to have some sense of, mm -hmm. of uh, how you collected your information. And in fact, you, you focus only in this series so far on the public sector as opposed to both sectors as well. So why just the public sector and not the private sector? Let's start there. So this first leg of the investigation is laying down you know, a data uh, base here that we can build off of and explore in future stories. And as you mentioned, the, the primary data set focuses on the public sector. And the reason for that is it's the only detailed workplace data that's available in Canada. Um, the first uh, leg of the story did also look at TSX companies, um, but I can set that aside for now because the, the primary one is this the, the public sector. Um, we collected, you probably heard of the Sunshine List. We've collected the Sunshine List equivalents in every province that has um, legislation. Uh, PEI, New Brunswick, the territories and the federal government don't. Um, and we focused on four key areas because it had the cleanest data, it was the most comparable. That's universities, large cities, municipalities, um, the provincial government, so departments, ministries, and also public and crown corporations. These are the places that, uh, you know, handle your regional transit. They do housing, they sell alcohol, cannabis. There's, um, you know, 80 of them across the country that we collected. Um, and they're structured like private businesses, but they're owned by government. And we collected all of that information. There's records for nearly 90,000 employees at 244 different entities. And we took all the first names and submitted them to Statistics Canada. And we paid Statistics Canada to give us the gender probability of a first name. So 90% of first names in Canada are associated with a specific gender at least 95% of the time. So that's how we were able to marry these two data sets and pinpoint where the women were. Now, about, I think, 11% of the names in our database did not meet this 95% threshold. So what we did then was we did a data science analysis to identify areas of volatility. And by that, I mean, let's say there's one entity or one salary band that has a lot of unknown names where things could swing depending on, on how those people land. Uh, we identified those areas of volatility, and then we manually either researched or contacted more than a thousand people to resolve those issues. Huh. Okay, here is, um, well, here's what you found out. And Sheldon, I'm going to ask you to bring this graphic up now at the top of the third page. Here we go. And for those listening on podcast, I'll just go into this in some detail, because here is what the Globe and Mail found. The graph shows that the divide between men and women who are, for example, CEOs, city managers, deputy ministers, presidents, in other words, we're talking about people high up the food chain here. At publicly owned corporations, men make up 71% to women's 29%. In municipalities, again, a big gender split, 93% men at the top levels, women just 7%. At universities, 76% of the top spots are male, women just 24%. Provincial governments, interestingly enough, a little more of an even keel here. It looks 58% uh, of men having the top jobs, 42% women. A little more even there. Uh, Robin, of course, uh, being journalists, we'd like to look at the anomaly first. So tell us, why would provincial governments be more even than everybody else he surveyed? That was, I mean, one of the most interesting things when we started getting the data back is there were huge gaps in all three of the four pillars, but provincial governments, like, 
across the board, we're, we're quite even. Um, you know, that graph just looked at the top leaders, but we also looked at the broad executive level. So the key decision makers, these are kind of like the tier down below the top leader. Uh, we also looked at salary bans, as mentioned, and provincial governments were like more or less 50-50 everywhere. And their the wage gap was incredibly small. Like it was nearly identical. Um, we didn't get into, I, I can tell you anecdotally what I've heard about why. Um, I did interview uh, some female uh, deputy ministers who, who, who are the top leaders. Um, and they said that in, <laughs> they found actually in their careers as governments, um, as people sort of viewing government and institutions more negatively in the past you know, decade or so, they saw more men leaving the public service for the private sector. I don't, I can't say whether that is why, but I think that that was a sentiment that I heard among some of the women is that it seemed to them it was easier to rise, that there was less competition. Um, I also think that there is just more scrutiny on, on provincial governments. Uh, that's very kind of core traditional public uh, service as opposed to say a crown corporation, which is structured like a private entity and which the public really maybe doesn't pay as much attention to. Um, and the other thing is on the wage gap side, these are jobs where, you know, deputy ministers are making the same amount. Um, there's not as much room for kind of extra money here or there as there might be in other types of public entities. I will say just quickly on the provincial government side, it was so even, and we were so interested by it, that we decided to drill a little further. And when you break the massive provincial workforce into the ministry level, that's where you see huge divides in terms of numbers, that the men are concentrated in ministries that are typically associated with male-dominated professions that pay more in the private sector, such as finance, uh, environment, energy, et cetera. I wonder if part of it is effort, because I remember even as long as 25 years ago, that far back, uh, Mike Harris made it a point to hire the secretary to cabinet as a woman. And then from almost from that moment forward, there have been, there's been a real push by successive premiers to have female mm -hmm. deputy ministers and as many as possible. Effort matters, obviously, right? I think, yeah, I think that's what I'm saying with the idea that this is much more public, that you see this layer. And I think you've seen governments respond to that by putting women in these positions. Um, I think to that point that you've just made when I, I've been asked a lot about solutions to this problem since the series is run and you need that effort. You need to make a concerted effort to diversify your staff, not just by gender, but on race with um, you know, LGBTQ2 people with people with disabilities. Like it has to, it, it doesn't just happen on its own. You have to make, take those steps. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to humor me now because I'm gonna ask a series of questions that are gonna seem very bizarre. So here goes. I mean, you look at the gender gap here, 71, 29, 93, 7, 76, 20, it's huge. There are big gender gaps here. Is this a problem? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's a problem. Um, I think maybe what you're getting at is the idea of preference. Um, is it a bad thing if a woman wants to not devote herself entirely to her career, uh, which is something that people say, you know, that men uh, fetishize their jobs more than women? And is that really something that needs to be corrected in women? Or is it something that we should take a look at for everybody, including men, that maybe that's not a healthy way to live? I think what this series is trying to get at is, if you want to stay home and be with your children, that is amazing. If you want to take a job that allows you more flexibility for work-life balance, that's amazing. If you want to rise to the highest levels possible in your job, you shouldn't encounter barriers because you're a woman. That's what this is getting at, is the people who want to rise are, are uh, shouldn't have to encounter additional layers um, of, of barriers that, that men don't. Well, that's what I'm what you, of course, brilliantly anticipated where my next question was gonna go because I've had this conversation with lots of people in the past and, and I've had people say to me, look, I'm not surprised that only 25% of the university presidents are women. Who the heck wants to work? What, like, yeah. what sane woman wants to work 80 hours a week, most of it fundraising, most of it dealing with, with you know, professors who are annoying about this, that, or the other thing, uh, never seeing your family? I mean, on the one hand, it's a great job. On the other hand, it's a job that requires huge sacrifices. 
men are prepared to, more men than women are prepared to make those sacrifices, and that's what these numbers reflect. Is that fair to say? I mean, I guess I would push back a little on the sacrifices mm -hmm. front because I think you know, what is a sacrifice? Is working at work a sacrifice or is working at home a sacrifice? I can say that in my own household, my husband uh, has split. We, we split. I have had two maternity leaves and we split them both. And in fact, with my second child, he took slightly more time off than me. I think it is way harder to work in the home uh, than out of the home. Like it is it is very difficult and mind numbing <laughs> to do that work. So I think that's one thing. Uh, I guess to what your point I would say is the project is really trying to push past focusing at the very top because so often when we talk about these issues, it is focused on the broad salary gap, the broad wage gap number, or you know the number of women presidents, the number of women on corporate boards. Um, what we found is that, it, yes, there's a gap at the top, but there's also a gap on the way to the top, in the middle, among all managers directors, supervisors, senior managers, executive teams, vice presidents. It's like, sure, maybe more men are willing to work a million hours a week um, to be presidents. We can get into the socialization that happens from a young age of that, whether it's right or wrong, forget it. The point is, is that women can't get past these mid-level management jobs. And when over the course of your career, the compounding effect of making less or not rising to the same levels as a man is huge. And it puts women in really precarious situations. Um, and, you know, think of the impact on retirement. Women live longer. Um, there is more to this than just, you know, a, a women don't aren't, aren't prepared to work as much. Just to be clear, it's not my view. I'm just conveying yeah. what, I'm, what I'm hearing from others. You're going to get letters, Steve. You're going to get letters. That always happens. That always <laughs> happens, and, I, and I'm totally fine with it. Uh, let me ask you about this, um, and, and it may be too soon to say, because after all, we've been living under pandemic conditions for almost a year now. Do you know what's changed in this since the pandemic hit? We started this in 2018. And our data is from 2017, so the 2017 Sunshine Lear year. Um, the most recent data that's available, by the way, is 2019. Uh, it, you know, there is a lag time in, in what's possible here. And it took us a year to collect all the data. And, you know, Ontario bundles it up into a nice little bow and puts it on a website. But pretty much everywhere else, you have to go to individual places and either FOI the data or ask for it and get it sent to you, yada, yada, yada transcribe it all. Um, it, it was a long process. This is a marker of where we were at before the world unraveled. And I think when you're listening to economists, they'll say that um, they're very concerned that the pandemic is going to undo uh, the modest gains that were made beforehand. So since the pandemic, at one point, we saw women's participation in the labor force hit a three-decade low. Um, as there has been some recovery, women are uh, rejoining the workforce at a, a slower rate than men. Um, I think the one thing that I'm really interested in is most women that I know haven't had to quit their jobs, but they are still taking on a brunt of the unpaid work at home, um, just because that's how our society is socialized. Um, and are they going to have a harder time getting promoted in future? Women already had this, this kind of unfair stereotype about them that they aren't as committed to their jobs as men. And, you know, is this going to be a problem? I interviewed one woman who is a senior manager at a, at a very large bank whose uh, boss encouraged her to take an unpaid leave. Otherwise, um, her distracted nature at work was going to uh, show up on her performance review, a performance review that's going to follow you around when you apply for new jobs or raises or promotions. So that's going to be something really difficult to study. Um, but I think it's going to be a huge issue. And obviously, um, women are more likely to work in industries that have been harder hit. So we're looking at hospitality, we're looking at food, uh, the service industry, care. Um, there's a reason this has been called a she session. That seems like a very unfair thing for that senior manager to have told the woman you just referenced there. How did she respond or react to that? She took an unpaid leave. Hmm. So and she, she uh, she's, you know, she, she, she has a great quote in the story that's basically... 
like the, the manager also said, you know, can your husband pick up some of the, the extra work? And she said, you know, when it comes to deciding who is going to take the unpaid leave or take the kid to the doctor's appointments or go to the recital, it's not actually a question because my husband makes a dollar seventy for every dollar that I make, and we need his salary to pay our mortgage. So it's not it's not a choice. And what was also interesting is when they first got together and started dating, they had similar uh, education, similar work experience, and were making within five thousand dollars of each other. But you know, fast forward five ten years, and that's the gap. Hmm. All right. In our remaining moments, then you have identified a problem that needs fixing. What do you want to do about it? So this is going to be the subject of future stories, but I think there's some big things that jump out. One is transparency. The biggest weapon that uh, that people have, in at least in terms of salary, is having an understanding of what they should be paid. I interviewed many women, uh, particularly at universities, who were offered positions, uh, and then they checked what their predecessor was making before them and realized that they were being offered less money than a male predecessor and were able to use that as leverage. So I don't think we're suggesting that every private company publish a list of employees and their salaries, but you look at uh, the United Kingdom where there is laws that companies with over 250 employees have to publish wage uh, gap information at different quartiles of the workforce. That's something to look at. Maybe companies uh, can provide their own employees with salary bans. So people have an idea of what colleagues are making. Broader transparency in general. So. Um, and not just on on the the gender wage gap, but on representation and diversity more generally. You know, we did find in our statistics that of the very few women who do make it through, they're almost entirely white. So the solution has to make sure that we're not just fixing this one very narrow problem. The other thing, which is the subject of the story that we ran last week about the the fact that the laws are not being enforced. So if you are um, if you are encountering, encountering gender discrimination at work, you can't sue in a regular courtroom. The, the body that was set up to deal with these complaints is the human rights tribunal system. And the human rights tribunal system is so dramatically underfunded and under-resourced across the country that it can take two to four years just to get a hearing. That's on average. I've interviewed people where it's taken much longer. Um, a very common thing is women are still getting fired all the time after telling their employers that they're pregnant. And you think that that's obviously not happening anymore because it's been illegal for decades. But if that happens to you, what do you do? Um, the rewards for speaking up and becoming you know, a, a known complainer, uh, they're very few, right? There's a huge risk to that. And the result is that people are, are taking settlement agreement. So the same kind of deals that were silencing Harvey Weinstein's accusers for uh, and enabling his behavior, we found are being used to resolve all manner of gender discrimination complaints, whether it's uh, pay disparity or promotion, um, sexual harassment, bullying, pregnancy discrimination. And because these almost always include NDAs, we never hear about them. And this is really obscuring our understanding of the problem. So this is another transparency issue, I think, that um, you know, we asked all the places in our data set, uh, how many gender discrimination complaints have you received? How many did you resolve with settlement agreements? And almost none uh, agreed to answer that question. So I don't think, again, we're looking for places to publish settlement agreements with people, because that's obviously not going to serve either party. Um, but I think at least knowing that they're happening and what the complaint is, having some amount of transparency of problems would go a long way. Well, Robin, as always, you and your team have done a really fabulous job on this series, which is all available on the Globe's website. And we thank you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing some of your views about it. Much appreciated. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.